Last week, we considered that people are to be held in high esteem are people like Timothy and Epaphroditus. This week, we look at people that are not to be highly regarded. These individuals are not to be emulated, followed, or looked upon favorably. These individuals have a false view of true spirituality. In our passage this evening, Paul primarily addresses Judaizers. What is described in this passage is not a critique on Judaism per se, that is the Judaism that's found in the Old Testament, but rather a rebuke of false understanding of Judaism. These were individuals who had a false confidence in Jewish rituals and practices alone. While at first glance, they might appear to be very spiritual because they are very religious and very zealous. However, they are what is referred to later as enemies of the cross of Christ. So our theme is this evening that we must be on guard against anyone that would teach us that salvation is based on anything other than faith in Christ Jesus alone. Paul strongly warns the Philippians to be on guard against those who would place any confidence in their own goodness for obtaining righteousness. The seriousness of the problem with the Judaizers is seen in the threefold warning. Judaizers were people that were interested and were insisting that in addition to believing Jesus, people had to adopt several of the practices of Judaism. Three times the Philippians are encouraged to look out. Philippians 3.2, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. The word translated as look out literally means to see. The thought here is that the Philippians are not to be taken in by the Judaizers, but rather to see them for what they really are. They are not the epitome of spirituality. Rather, they are in opposition to true spirituality. The seriousness of the problem with the Judaizers is seen in the threefold scathing affirmations that Paul enjoins in describing the Judaizers. This is how the Judaizers are to be seen or viewed. First, Judaizers are seen to be as dogs in Philippians 3.2. Look out for the dogs. Dogs was a derogatory term that the Jews used to describe the Gentiles. Jesus himself used this metaphor in describing the Jewish concept of Gentiles. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 and following, it reads, And behold, a Canaanite woman came out from that region, and they began to cry out, saying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came to him and kept asking him, saying, Send her away, for she is shouting after us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, Is it not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs? Thus, in employing this term, Paul is saying that the Judaizers are not real Jews at all. They are no better than the Gentiles that these Judaizers would put down. Again, what is described in this passage is not a critique on Judaism per se, but rather an attack on a false understanding of Judaizers. Judaizers are to be seen as workers of evil. Philippians 3.2 Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Rather than be admired, held in high regard, or viewed as superior and spiritual, the Judaizers would be seen as workers who do evil. Now that certainly is not how they would have viewed themselves. But in Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, Jesus writes and says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Rather than achieving spirituality, and leading others to obtain spirituality, 
These Judaizers are opponents of true spirituality and actually lead people to their destruction. The Judaizers are, in fact, zealous hard workers. However, their hard work is accomplishing not good, but evil. Zeal or religious fervor is not enough in achieving a right standing before God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and following, Paul writes and says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, that is nationalistic Israel, is for their salvation. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. So these are individuals that, being ignorant about how to be truly righteous, go about to establish their own righteousness, and it is unacceptable for, before God. There is nothing admirable concerning people who are zealous for false religious faith. Application. We might be embarrassed sometimes by the kind of commitment that is manifested by cultic followers. These are individuals who dedicate themselves to their cult. Uh, they make all kinds of sacrifices. And yet, we should not be taken in or deceived simply by re religious fervor or fanaticism. That is not the mark of true spirituality, nor is it the means of acceptance before God. Judaizers are to be seen as those who practice a false circumcision, that is, they corrupt and distort the meaning and purpose of circumcision. They taught one needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. The NAS translates that as false circumcision. Thus, what the Judaizers are espousing is not true circumcision at all. It's merely a mutilating of the flesh. Now, the procedure is no different from genuine circumcision and what the Judaizers are doing. When it talks about mutilating the flesh, it's not saying that they somehow are not performing this ritual in a proper way. But rather, it is saying the ritual, when not accompanied by faith and when not trusting solely in God for salvation, is of no benefit. It is no use. It's just like mutilating the flesh. Application. We're given a description of the Judaizers, not a list of names of those who are Judaizers. Thus, the Philippians and ourselves need to practice discernment in encountering people of other faiths, other religions. Now, when we talk about circumcision, this is all foreign to us as Christians, and we might not see much relevance for us today. But a parallel can be drawn between the Judaizers' teaching on circumcision, and the erroneous teaching of many Christian people concerning baptism in our day. There are those that would teach a person is born again through baptism, or others that would say you need to have faith in Christ and to be baptized in order to be saved. Such views of baptism are erroneous. They are to be rejected. And just as those that were circumcised did not profit themselves in not having faith in Lord Jesus Christ, so too it is not through baptism that we're brought into union and communion with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by faith in him and him alone. Baptism administered in any other way simply is profitless in having any spiritual effect upon an individual. Paul gives the reason as to why the Philippians need to be on guard against the Judaizers. The Philippians are already truly circumcised. Verse 3, it says, For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. True circumcision bases its confidence solely upon Jesus Christ and not in the circumcision at all. Philippians 3.3, 3, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. 
Paul gives his own testimony that he does not place confidence in his own goodness or merit, but rather solely in faith in Jesus Christ. Paul had been brought up as a good Jew, but Paul did not put any confidence in his religiosity as a means of being acceptable before God. And so he goes into rather uh, great detail concerning what his upbringing was like and how futile it was in accomplishing anything for God. Paul says if salvation were by circumcision, as the Judaizers taught, then Paul would have good reason to believe that he was saved as a result of having kept the law. Verse 4, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. So Paul says that he has more reason to boast in his religiosity than anyone else. For Paul surpassed what the Judaizers taught about circumcision. Paul was circumcised exactly as the law required in verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. Paul was a Jew by physical descent, not a Gentile who had converted to Judaism through circumcision. Verse 5, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was a Hebrew-speaking Jew, not a speak Greek-speaking Jew. He says a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In that term, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, it's talking about people who were Hebrew-speaking Jews. After the Babylonian exile of the Jewish nation, there were many Jews that lost the ability to speak Hebrew. And in the time of the New Testament, under the command of the uh, Roman Empire, most of the Jews were Hellenistic Jews. That means that they spoke Greek, not Hebrew. So Paul says, I was one of those Hebrew-speaking Jews. Those individuals were looked up to, whereas the Greek-speaking individuals were looked down upon. Paul had practiced a strict adherence to the Jewish law. It says at the end of verse 5, as to the law of Pharisee. The Pharisees were known in that New Testament era of being the strictest of the sects of Jews. These were the most orthodox. These were the ones that gave the greatest attention to following the Old Testament laws and commands. Paul was zealous, even to the point of persecuting the church. In verse 6, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, Paul was zealous for his faith. He believed in being a good Jew. And so he says, in summary, if righteousness could come by keeping the law, then he was righteous at the end of verse 6. As to the righteousness under the law, blameless. He had done everything that he was instructed to do in his childhood and as he grew up and matured in his Judaism application. It's important to keep in mind the change that took place in the Apostle Paul. He was converted on the road to Damascus. He had a, a counter with Jesus. And Jesus said to Paul, how long are you going to kick against the goads? How long are you going to resist the truth? And so Paul committed himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after his conversion, Paul's religious zeal was transformed. Now he was not persecuting others, but rather trying to win them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. However, Paul put no confidence in his own righteousness, only the righteousness that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things that he had done in his earlier life meant nothing for spirituality. That which Paul previously viewed as good works now count for nothing, in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ, meaning that they didn't bring him any closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul views all of his righteousness as garbage. It says in verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul says, it doesn't benefit me anything. It is worthless. Not only is it not necessary, as the Judaizers were saying, but contrary to that, it has no benefit whatsoever other than to be discarded, thrown out like the trash. Paul's complete confidence is found only in the righteousness of Jesus Christ in verse 9. And to be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Salvation is faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing. And future messages will see how true religious zeal should be manifested. But tonight, reflect upon this. First, we're not to be taken in by the false religions that surround us. We are not to be impressed by the religious zeal of those who do not place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are made right with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone. It is our faith in Christ that makes us acceptable to God. All other teaching is to be rejected. No matter how sincere or even dedicated the proponents of other views appear to be, we are to be on the lookout, be on guard, trust in Christ alone.